Shalom Chavrim. Uh, it's good to, to get a chance to come to speak with you guys again. And uh, just wanted to talk to you a, a few short words here and also give you a little update on uh, Alan Lamont, Brother Alan. Uh, he is doing well. He's uh, There's nothing has happened to him for those that I know that have worried about uh, excuse me, his condition. But uh, Brother Alan is doing just fine. I was able to contact him and um, uh, he just let me know that as of right now he has a change that he feels in his heart that God is calling him for in his ministry and so he's pulled back a little bit and he is um, just preparing and studying for what God has for him next so uh, I just thank God that we were able to um, to reach out and to find out this information uh, anyway I just want to kind of go right into some things here for you um, there was a sister that wrote me a question, and this was about Israel. And um, uh, it, it's not that she doesn't believe that Israel should be in their homeland, but she was asking the question, um, is this the right timing for it? Because we look at the Zionist movement, is, is what it's normally uh, called, and a lot of people believe that because the Rothschilds uh, had a part in the establishment of the state of Israel, therefore it's not actually God himself doing this. So I just thought I would take a little bit of time with you and share some scriptures with you that, that might put that to rest for you. At least I hope it does. And, um, and then look at a few other things quickly while we have a little bit of time here. I'm actually out of town right now. Uh, in the background, you are looking at Miami Beach. Uh, we are uh, just some of the work that I have actually has me out of town. So um, that's where I'm at right now, just waiting for a pickup that I need to do and then can go about. So I brought everything with me to take a little time to put this uh, video together for you. Anyway, uh, let's, let's, I'm going to bounce around with some different scriptures for you here. Starting off with Zechariah chapter 12, uh, we read here. Uh, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth his heavens and layeth the foundations in the earth and the former, formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Okay. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, there have been some people that have tried to suggest that this is what was happening during the days of Titus when he besieged Jerusalem. But as we know, Titus wasn't cut in pieces just because he burdened himself with Jerusalem, so there's no way that this could apply back during that time. This is definitely a future event, and uh, I'll show you some more here that to, to, to understand that better. Uh, verse 4. Um, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his, and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes in the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. This is your speaking of the different horse riders of Revelation, I believe, here. And this is also why Moses prophesies in uh, Exodus 15 that I will sing unto the Lord that I have gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, speaking of the Antichrist. Um, it says, uh, verse 5, And the governors of Judah shall, shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall, shall uh, be my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the, the governors of Judah like an earth, a fire among the wood and like a torch of fire and the sheaf and, and they shall devour all the people round about uh, uh, on the right hand and on the left and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place even Jerusalem the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah and this is showing that as the way the dispersion happened, Judah went out last. She's going to come back first is how God is going to do it, the house of Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So he didn't, do, didn't defend them back during the times of Titus when Titus did this. We know it couldn't have happened then. 
and that and, and he that is feeble among them all at that day shall be as David and the house of David shall be as God as the angel of the Lord before them and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem again that's in the days we're living in now. All the nations are going to come against Jerusalem. Now, there was a very interesting verse, though, right there, if you've noticed. And I don't know if you caught this or not. Um, when he says, uh, And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as, uh, as the angel of the Lord before them. That actually comes from... Um, Jonathan's son in the story of David when David as I mentioned to you a few videos back when when David went out of the city and Jonathan's son um, was not able to go with him uh, and it was a lie was told about him but he wanted to go he beheld David as an angel of God is what he said in his sight and so God is showing again how God is going to look at the children of Israel now showing that that type that happened many, many years before this time, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, would repeat in this modern days. And so God is showing you that it is true that the story of David does type when Yeshua came and he was rejected and sent to all the world that again, he would return just as David would return. And it would be those that rejected him that have to be in the homeland. And this is what's very important about this. Um, notice what he says, verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of, and of supplication. They shall look upon uh, me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And he shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as in the mourning of Hadron, Hadron, and the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Now remember, in that video I just recently did for you, I go back to the story of David in the second book of Samuel, and I shared with you how that it was David's story is a perfect type, the house of Judah uh, there, and, and how that David was not recognized as king by his own son, but yet his son exalts himself into his place, and David as a rejected king leaves, just as Yeshua was rejected by Israel, and this is a beautiful type, God is showing, God literally this is, let me say something to my Jewish brother. This is literally, God is trying to show you by the prophet Zechariah that you would be rejected. That, that the prophet, that, that, that Yeshua would be rejected because he's telling you here, showing you the future event right here. There's no way this is, could have been during the times of, of the destruction of the second temple. It's impossible. We can see that clearly. That it could not have been during that time because God did not rescue his people. He did not bring all the nations down. He did not destroy them all. But he clearly shows us the evidence when he says in verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. In verse uh, verse 8, notice how he said in verse 8 again, And that day shall the Lord be uh, defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David he that is feeble he, he's talking about Shimei because Shimei was uh, excuse me not Shimei but it was uh, Jonathan's son Jonathan's son in David's time and I forget how you pronounce his name there it's an awkward name to pronounce but he was the one that was the was feeble among David and said David's table David took care of him and now he is saying that the inhabitants of, of Jerusalem or, or excuse me yeah the inhabitants of Jerusalem that'll be in Jerusalem then he's gonna look at you as he did back with Jonathan's son that David cared for and he's given us a beautiful type. Zechariah is showing us that we should be comparing the Mashiach that, what, that had come 
to the story of David back in 2 Samuel. And he puts it in a future event. So therefore, Mashiach has already come. David is a type of that Mashiach. You have to look at 2 Samuel and see the beautiful story from chapter 16 all the way to chapter 19 there. This is where you see that story. And he says in here, And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And isn't that exactly what Jonathan's son said to David? He says, I, he says in my eyes, you're as, as the angel of the Lord. So he clearly, through Zechariah's prophecy, is trying to make you go back and look at the story of David and 2 Samuel because he's going to now tell you what happens to Mashiach here. How that you will look upon him whom you pierced and you will mourn. Well, the one that was pierced was Yeshua. And Yeshua, everything that happened to Yeshua, the same thing happened with David. They, he was rejected. He left Israel. He went up the Mount of Olives. He looked back. He wept over, the, over Israel for being rejected. Then Shimei comes out, spits on him, condemns him, curses him and everything. Only to find out that the very same families that rejected David rejected Yeshua and we find that they're the very ones that come into Israel in modern days and it must happen. They must be there. Because why? God blinded Israel in order for the Gentiles to have sight. And this is why David makes the famous expression and he says to them, you, why were you not, why are you the last to invite me back home? I am bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, and yet you of all the peoples of Israel, you're the last ones to invite me back home. Why is this? It's prophetic. And when he says you are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, it was he's, he's literally taking you back. As Jewish people, he's taking us back to the Garden of Eden and showing that we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. That's what Adam said about Eve. And when she came forth, see, God had already breathed, Nishmat Chaim, he had breathed the Spirit of Almighty God into that body in a plural form, showing that Adam and Eve both were filled with the Holy Ghost. This is exactly what we have. And so this happens, and here David speaks of this, I am bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, prophesying that the Messiah, Moshiach, would be bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. In other words, Mashiach would become a human being. And so, now, in, in answering the question that my sister had that was asking this question, Israel has to be in their homeland, and specifically the house of Judah, the very Jews that rejected him, their descendants must be in Israel, in the homeland, to be the ones to invite him back. To be the ones to see him. Because we also see in the story of David, when David comes back, he doesn't cross the river Jordan until what? He sends word to the two witnesses, the two priests that he left behind. He told them, he said, let me know everything that goes on. And then he sends word to them, and they get the house of Judah. According to the Samuel the prophet, they were able to get the entire house of Judah in one mind, as one heart, to receive David back as king. And this is exactly what the two witnesses will do. They will get the Jewish people of one heart and one mind and one accord to be able to receive Yeshua as Mashiach. So it's important that, that we recognize this here. Uh, and, and then as we go on, we find out, as I said to you, the house of Nathan, the house of David apart. Uh, both of them are from the tribe of Judah. Uh, the house of Levi and their wives apart. That is the Levites that were there during that time. And of course the house of Shemai, which Shemai is a Benjamite. This is what made up the house of Judah, were these three tribes. And he says, in all the houses that remain, the Samaritans were the ones that remained. So that's what's so beautiful about it. It's perfectly setting the stage the way it was when Yeshua left. He resets the stage again in Zechariah the exact same way. Now this is why I say as far as Rome being in control in Israel when he returns, it has to be fulfilled this way. Because when Yeshua left, when he left, uh, when he left this earth, Rome was in control then. The Jews wanted to be delivered from the Romans. And so now Rome is once again back 
and so the whole stage has got to be set up again. And that Antichrist spirit must be defeated. Now, according to Moses' prophecy, he will sing, I have gotten victory over, over his horse and over his rider. Now, now, God gives Moses that song, Asherah Adonai Ga'aga'o Berekeva Berekeva Ah, I have to go back and read. I'm sorry. So, a kid don't have it memorized. But anyway, he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. Now, if Moses can prophetically know that that song has to be sung, then undoubtedly he's going to be the one because in his song, his song is prophecy. His song says, I will get Asherah. I will sing. I will be the one that sings that I've gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. So, uh, it's, there again, it's why I'm passionate about uh, the way I am about that. Um, so, so it kind of sets the stage for us right there that Israel must be in her homeland for these things to be fulfilled. Um, let's look at a couple other scriptures here real quick. Um, another one is Micah. And I'm just showing you some passages that show you why Israel has to be in their homeland. It doesn't matter how that the nation was set up. Okay, let, understand that. Though the political leaders that are there, and we can find in Daniel chapter 11, we'll go into that for a little bit if we can here, if time permits. I'll talk to you a little bit about Daniel 11 that shows there's a side of the Jewish people that will never believe Mashiach. In fact, the majority of them that are there don't. You know, so even like when I talked to Brother, Brother Jesse on BP Earthwatch, you know, and he talked about being, you know, a large percentage of, of, of Jewish people are not really Jews. I would have to say that, that most of them are Jewish, but there is one part that may be true, though, and as clearly it shows in the book of Daniel, not everyone that claims to be Jewish is going to believe the two witnesses in the first place. But there is a remnant, the Bible says, that will believe. And that's what God's coming for, is that remnant. Let's look at Micah, though, another beautiful scripture that shows that uh, this all has to be set up for a purpose. Um, Beginning, let's start about verse 6. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that that uh, that hateth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And he's talking about Israel. And I will make her that, ha that, that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. So even though there's going to be calamity, from this point forward, he's going to reign over his people. Okay? And thou, o tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of, of Zion, and to thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Hmm, again, notice, because see, even when it's talking about David over in Zechariah, it speaks about Jerusalem. He's speaking of the house of Judah, because they have to be there first. Now, there are remnants of the other tribes starting to come back in, but there's a little difference in that. I'm, I'm beginning to notice a little difference here, so I just want to share that with you. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is Now, see, here's what's interesting. Verse 8, And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughters of Zion, and to thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Okay, so he's restoring Israel, but watch what he says next. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Hmm. Israel's on their reverse order. Remember me talking about that, how we rejected Samuel the prophet, we wanted a king, wanted to be like the rest of the world, have a king lead us out in our battles, only to find out it didn't work, and finally Ahab sold us out, and we ended up being dispersed throughout the world. Okay, so God asked that question, is there no king in thee? You wanted a king. He's reminding us of our mistake that we made with, back during when we rejected Samuel the prophet. Then he makes another astonishing statement. Is thy counselor perished? My Jewish brother, and he's the counselor. What, what did they say the Mashiach was going to be called? Counselor, Prince of Peace. The mighty God, El Gibor. Uh, come on. Is your counselor perished? Had he died a long time ago? He's gathered you back, but he's asking you, is your counselor perished? Zechariah said, we're going to look upon him whom we pierced. And we're going to mourn as one that lost their only son. 
Start putting the put the prophecies together, my brethren, and my sisters. Is your counselor perished for pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail? Now God has said He just gathered them back, and now He's saying pain is 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 taken upon him as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt be even to Babylon. And there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Modern day Babylon, Rome. Because what do you do? You go to Rome to get yourself a peace covenant. Instead of accepting the true Prince of Peace, Yeshua, who came to start with and paid that price, now Ahab's son, Shimon Perez, takes us back to a fake uh, prince, uh, a false prince that shall come, a false peacemaker called Pope uh, Francis, and sells us out there. So anyway, let's kind of move on right here. Um, verse 10, we're still in verse 10 here. Thou shalt go out into the field. Okay, so the reason why we're going out into the field and everything, we're, we're being kicked out of the city. But yet God gathered us back. We're being kicked out of the city, though. Part of the peace agreement. Split the city in half. Get yourself two nations there. Now, also, many nations are gathered against thee that say, let me be... De let her be defiled, and let her let our eye look upon Zion. And they're they're going to have ten Arab nations join with the Vatican. You got the United Nations. You got America against Israel. You got the European Union against Israel. Everybody's got their eye on Israel, and they want to divide it up, and and, and they want to give the Christians a, a piece of the pie. They want to give the which they call it Christians. They want to give the Catholic Church a piece of the pie, okay? Now, brothers, that, that is not true Christianity. They want to give the Catholics a piece of the pie. They want to give the Muslims the Temple Mount and the Kotel to where the Jews have to go through the uh, auspices of the Palestinian Authority to be able to go to the Wailing Wall. That is nothing but pure nonsense. Well, it's not even pure. Purity is not, that's not purity, that's filth. God calls it an abomination, so we shouldn't call it anything pure. It's, it's, it's filth. Now many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, and neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves unto the floor. So, see... My sister, and, and as well as other people that, that have come, I know uh, Rob Skiba as well has this idea that Israel should not be there. It's not right yet. God has not gathered us. Yes, He has. He plainly shows that He gathers. That's what He says up here, verse 6. And that day saith the Lord, Will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant and her that was cast far off a strong nation. See, he brings us back, but we have to come back. You have to realize where we rejected God, we have to come back to that place and face where we rejected God to get back in the favor of God. Israel paid a tremendous price. God blinded us so that the Gentiles could have sight. Now, as a result of that, now we are, we are back in the homeland, and now he's going to open our eyes so we can see where we went wrong at. And he's laid all these different scriptures together to prove this to us so that we would know exactly where we're at. All right, let's take a little bit more here, and then we'll stop here. We'll kind of close here. Um, so he goes on to say, um, let's see here, verse 12. But... But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooks brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. Okay, so we are going to be victorious. Now, let's quickly take a look at Daniel as well. Um, Actually, I have Ezekiel marked here. What did I mark Ezekiel? Oh, that was the Gog and Magog. 
Yeah, let, oh, that's something. Let me just share something with you. Now, I, I did a little video on this a few days ago, and then I turned the video off. Uh, I made a mistake in there. My wife, uh, as far as I accidentally had two of them recorded together, so only about 60 people saw it and probably wonder what in the world happened to it. This is a personal observation of mine, and I'm going to go ahead and share it with you now before I continue on. I believe that what's going on right now, and you're fixing to hear a jet in the background, pardon me for that, but I believe what's going on right now is that they may very well bring the United States economy to a near, to a near collapse, if not to a complete collapse. Now, I'm just saying this maybe. I can't say that for sure. But they may do that as a result to cause Israel to, or to force Israel into signing this peace covenant. Because with all the oil that was found and all the natural gas that's been found there now, and they found this long before they started this peace process. This is why John Kerry and the Vatican, especially the Vatican in the background, is pushing so hard for the two-state solution. Because they know that if Israel doesn't go along with the two states and Israel begins to drill for oil and gas, and they get this, Israel doesn't need anybody any longer for the financial stability of the world or for their country. Then they would be their own people. They wouldn't have any of these problems that they have financially depending on the United States. So I think that it may be an agenda of the Vatican to intentionally collapse the United States economy before Israel can get a hold of that, as well as force Israel to a place to sign this covenant, because why? They also want to keep Israel from getting independence financially. This is why you see the Gog and Magog war. Now, isn't it ironic that uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and I'd said this on that video a few days ago, and I, th I think Brother uh, Brother Paul Begley did a video uh, right after that, speaking about the same thing: how that how that Mahmoud Abbas goes to Vladimir Putin and they sign an agreement for the gas and oil. Now you may not know this, uh, but in, I think it's in 1995, Russia had already recognized the Palestinians as a state, and so they're making a deal, even though there is no state. This is only going to cause a war sure enough this will incite your Gog and Magog war because here they are signing a deal the the Catholic Church is going to cheat both uh, Jews and Palestinians alike Palestinians think they're getting a great deal they're not they're only going to get they're really going to get messed over by the Vatican and we find that in Ezekiel 35 um, uh, or I believe it was in Ezekiel 35 or or, 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 or Isaiah 35. I'll have to go back and look at that for you. But yeah, let me just quickly show you this here. Um, uh, I can't remember if this is where that's at or not. Um, uh, oh, let me read this to you though. This is, this may not be what I was looking for, but let me just read this to you. Um, That, that, uh, excuse me here, this is chapter 39. Therefore thou son of man prophesy against God and say, Thus saith the Lord uh, God, Behold, I am against thee, O God, and the chief prince of uh, Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and I will cause thine arrows to fall on thy right hand. And they shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, that thou and, and thy bands, and the people that be with thee. And I will give uh, thee unto the ravenous birds even of every sort, to the beasts of the field, to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and I will send a fire, of Mag a fire on Magog and among them that dwell uh, carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that the Lord, the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So this is also when, as I've always believed, that God makes known His name. Now notice how God defeats them with 
fire. Remember the two witnesses, fire proceedeth from their mouth and destroys their enemies. Remember what I said to you about Psalm 83. It is not a war like you think. It is God sending down his two hidden ones, in this case here, they're the hidden ones, that they have consulted against, trying to figure out who are the two witnesses is what they're trying to figure out now so that they can do something to stop it. But he sends those two witnesses down and they bring an end to uh, the, the intent of Gog and Magog and all of their company with them. So there's going to be a massive slaughter and that is the Psalm 83. That is really just showing you the spiritual side where God brings the two witnesses up in order to destroy the enemy uh, that comes against Israel. So I just want to share that with you. Uh, just a beautiful little passage there. And uh, another one here is in verse 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword according to their uncleanliness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name and after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. So he's also, this is when he brings back the house of Israel and this kind of it, it, it appears to be that the house of Israel begins to come in after the Gog and Magog war. Now, I, I may be wrong on that. I do know that Michael Froon has found parts of the lost tribes of Israel and been bringing them back. That's, that's for another study that we'll go into. Uh, you could compare this to Hosea chapter uh, 6, verses about 1 to 3 or 4 there. <clears throat> another beautiful type. We also see in... in in Ezekiel chapter 36 where God swears that he would bring uh, the children of Israel back not for for their sake but for his name's sake uh, that's another one I will sanctify as uh, my great name verse 23 which was profaned among the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord saith the Lord God when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land so how does God sanctify his name remember the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name sanctify thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done God he was having you to pray for the return of Israel that's what he was doing and according to Ezekiel's prophecy here in chapter 36 verses 23 24 25 26 and 27 uh, that's exactly what he does. He sanctifies his name by bringing Israel back to their homeland. And that's what God says about it. Now, in closing, let me take you real quick to Daniel. And then we're going to close uh, with the book of Daniel here. And I'm just going to kind of highlight some, some points here that I wanted you to be able to see. This is in chapter 11.